or so, just asking a few questions about uh, one, one step. Now, everything I've, I've told you about is very phenomenological. General work for how to look at the system, we could look for signatures, but that's not very precise at all. Ideally, what we could do is we could calculate free energy barriers and relate those free energy barriers to experimental kinetics and start saying what types of energetic representations of the system are most consistent with the kinetics that we see experimentally. And ideally, what you could do is you just calculate your free energy barrier, you have a prefactor, and then you would, be, uh, you would obtain a rate. And this, r this prefactor is interpreted roughly as a barrier crossing attempt frequency. So if, if you are looking at uh, different processes, this prefactor can vary quite a bit. So if you're looking at chemical kinetics, it's on the order of inverse picoseconds. If you're looking at protein folding, it's or inverse microseconds. So you have this six order or more range of what this parameter could be. So you need to be very careful. You can't just take a number and apply it, or you're not going to be able to connect those barriers to any sort of meaningful rate. So we've tried to address this, and by doing that, we, again, took some tools from what people use in protein folding uh, very routinely, where you have a free energy, you have a diffusion coefficient as some function of a, of a reaction coordinate, and then we simply numerically evaluate this double integral to get the mean first passage time between two points on this free energy surface. Now when we do this, we're making some assumptions or we need to do some additional work to justify this approach. This approach assumes that you can describe the kinetics of the system well as a particle uh, undergoing diffusive motion along a 1D surface. So you can't just pick an arbitrary coordinate you know that your coordinate is, is appropriate for this representation. And maybe it's not. You also need to extract diffusion coefficients, and these have to be diffusion coefficients that relate to real time scales. So I won't tell you anything today about these diffusion coefficients other than to say that we've done about four microseconds of explicit solvent simulations with uh, the Sambamatsu group uh, and estimated these diffusion coefficients for a variety of conformational changes. I will tell you a little bit about how we define a, an appropriate coordinate, though. And my apologies, other people may have already talked about this topic in other contexts, and I, I just missed it, so hopefully it's not, not repetitive. So wh what do we mean by an appropriate reaction coordinate? Well, you can imagine that you have a system, and you, you pick a reaction coordinate, and you get some probability distribution. And you want to ask, is this prob probability distribution reflective of the underlying free energy barrier? Well. We often take this probability, take the natural log, and we say that's our, our free energy. But what happens if, in, say in this example case, this were the underlying distribution? So you have a 2D distribution, and we simply projected it onto this coordinate. This 1D description is consistent with this 2D probability. However, if you use the second coordinate, you would get a completely different probability distribution for this system. And this is just an artificial 2D example. So you can imagine in the ribosome where you have half a million degrees of freedom that if you just pick a random coordinate, you can get probabilities that aren't really that meaningful. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to identify the coordinates that actually give us the appropriate description of this free energy that's most reflective of the underlying barrier. And again, this is a problem that has been looked at quite a bit in the, in the protein folding and RNA folding uh, communities. So there are a lot of criteria you can set up to define an appropriate coordinate. You can say that if you use a particular reaction coordinate, you should get the right number of transitions. That's the most basic criterion. If you want to describe the motion as diffusion on a 1D surface, well, the motion should exhibit diffusive behavior. If you would like to say anything about the free energy barrier, that means you should be able to isolate the transition state ensemble precisely with that coordinate. So what we mean by that is that at the transition state, you're at a saddle point on the free energy. Half the time that you reach that point, you're going to connect the endpoints. So there's a 50% chance that you're undergoing a transition whenever you're at that point. So do you get a coordinate that exhibits that, that property or not? And then when you calculate diffusion coefficients, barriers, and kinetics, they should all be self-consistent with one, one another. So what we've been doing is we take these models where we can now generate hundreds of transitions, and then we start checking these statistical properties and comparing them against, against each other to get evidence as to whether or not the coordinates we're looking at are appropriate for the given conformational change, at least within the context of this model. So by long trajectory, this would be a, an example. This is a, a simulation where we looked at just this first step where the tRNA moves in about 20 angstroms. So it's just this first step. And this is an arbitrarily shown coordinate. And this is half of the trajectory. So this is about 50 transitions back and forth. In the trajectory, in the end, we had about 100, about 105 or 95, I can't remember exactly, 
the number of, of transitions that we had in this, in this run. So we now have enough transitions that we can start looking at statistics with some, some certainty. So with that, we start comparing our, all of our metrics. So the first metric is this probability of being on a transition path. And this is the metric that says, if you're at a transition state and you've detected accurately with that coordinate, half the time that you reach that value of the coordinate, you will connect the endpoints. And so you should reach a value of 0.5 if you have a coordinate that actually captures that saddle point in the free energy surface. So we can actually just numerically calculate this quantity for any arbitrary coordinate that we're interested in, in looking at. And these are four representative coordinates, all interatomic distances between the tRNAs. And you get values that can be close to 0.5, maybe around, sometimes up around 0.45, depending on the transition. And other times it's below 0.2. So you really can't just arbitrarily pick an interatomic distance and say it's good. You'd actually have, some of them will capture the transition state, some of them will not. So we go through this analysis, we can identify which ones are more reliable indicators of transition state is, and can give us a more uh, accurate description of what that underlying barrier is. We can also check the displacement squared as a function of lag time for all of our coordinates and see is it linear, or is it, which would be diffusive, or do we see characteristic subdiffusive behavior or super diffusive behavior as well. So we can go through all these coordinates, calculate hundreds or thousands of different coordinates for this data set, and start saying particular coordinates capture the transition state, and also give us diffusive behavior. So this is evidence that these coordinates are appropriate for applying this 1D diffusion on a, uh, uh, diffusion on a 1D surface uh, description to this conformational change. And when you do that, you can then say with some precision of what the, what the characteristics are of the transition state, at least within that model. So this would be a representative snapshot shown in four different representations of what this transition state uh, looks like. So what we see is here is our tRNA, tRNA molecule, and here is helix 89, which is just a, a very long elongated helix in the, uh, in the large subunit. And you immediately see there are very close steric interactions. This is that helix that I highlighted during the movie. I said it's making these close interactions. So sure enough, this is characteristic of the transition state is that it makes these close steric interactions with this helix. We've then gone back and we've removed this helix from our calculations, and the, the free energy barrier is gone. It just completely eliminates it. So we can actually say, this barrier arises almost essentially entirely due to the steric interactions between the tRNA and this one particular helix. Chemical side of things, and this gives us a foundation for a studying all of these conformational changes. All I've shown you now is that we can take a model and we can reliably calculate or identify the transition state or calculate the free energy barrier. Now we'd like to do something about it, uh, learn something about biology actually apply it to systems. So as I said, this accommodation process is, re is related to the proofreading step. So if you have your tRNA, shown here in yellow, initially associates with the ribosome, it gets delivered by elongation factor Tu, which is just shown as a sphere, a circle here. There is some propensity for making errors at this first step. And then what happens is EFTU can leave, the tRNA can accommodate, or the tRNA can be rejected. And this is essentially the schematic that you'll see in every biochemistry paper for proofreading. You have initial selection, and then you have these three different steps. And then if it's successful, you will add the amino acid to the growing protein chain. And so what we wanted to, to ask was, in our, in our initial simulations, we said EFTU was simply not present, meaning it dissociates very rapidly, and then accommodation occurs. But what if that's not exactly the case? Maybe EFTU doesn't dissociate rapidly, maybe it lingers. It delivers the tRNA, releases the tRNA, but stays in the vicinity of the ribosome for some period of time. Does it have any effect? Because this description of these three parallel routes was not um, shown to be more or less asserted because you have to start somewhere. You start with the simplest kinetic model you can apply and then try to interpret your data. And this was the model they came up, came up with about 20 or know, 30 years ago. So we wanted to challenge that, or at least say, is it important to even worry about this? Does it matter if these are parallel? Do they, uh, are they likely to affect one another? Now, one reason for asking this question was if you look at the experiments, <laughs> depending on which group you look at, uh, some people will tell you that EFT dissociates much faster than tRNA accommodation. Other groups will tell you that accommodation is much uh, the, in the inverse is true. So it really wasn't clear whether or not EFTU is still around when accommodation occurs or if it is gone when accommodation occurs. And if you 
our goal here was not to get in the middle of a, a fight between two big <laughs> high profile experimental uh, biochemical groups. We rather just wanted to say, well, is it really important which scenario is true? And then they still have to figure out which scenario <laughs> is actually going on in the ribosome. But does it matter? If, if EFTU comes here, it delivers the tRNA, and then doesn't dissociate rapidly, is that likely to have an effect on this accommodation process or not? So what we did was we took, again, our structure-based models, and we calculated our free energy profiles without EFTU, and then we repeated it with EFTU, and the only thing we included was the excluded volume. So EFTU is sitting there. It has no affinity for the tRNA, the same as delivering the tRNA and just letting it go. And just the fact that it occupies all of this space, is that enough to have an effect on this next step or not? And this is what we, what we see. So we have a fr our free energy profiles now as a function of these coordinates that we've identified as reliable coordinates. We got a barrier of, say, about 12 kT when elongation factor to you was not present. We repeat it with EFTU present, just the excluded volume effect, and the barrier goes down to about 2 kT. So there's a 10 kT change in the barrier height, just depending on whether or not EFTU is occluding space or not. And that would correspond to a roughly three order of magnitude change in the rate of accommodation for this. For this. So our immediate response to them is actually it's very important <laughs> whether or not EFTU is still there or not. So in the literature, they weren't so much arguing about whether or not EFTU is still present. They were just arguing about whether or not it's faster or slower because it's important that you get the right kinetics. But there wasn't a real um, biological uh, need to know more than just they wanted some certainty of what the rates were. So what we said is actually <laughs> it's extremely important how fast EFTU dissociates because that can have a tremendous effect on the next step of accommodation. Now, we don't like to just report results and then say this is the effect. We'd like to understand them or have some feel for what's going on. So if this is our 2D free energy profile, this is again our good coordinate. This is just some arbitrarily chosen coordinate. This would be the profile when EFTU is absent. So you have this very large, broad free energy minimum corresponding to that initial ensemble where EFTU delivers the tRNA. And then if EFTU is present, you simply don't access that in a phase space. So there's this really big search problem that can occur where the tail of the tRNA, which you saw was very mobile in the, in the, in the video, it has this big search that it simply can't do anymore. So it's similar to uh, crowding of a protein when you look at uh, folding in crowded environments, it's just the molecules crowding the tRNA. You have this disordered tail, the tail's crowded, and that's stabilizing the endpoint or destabilizing this initial, initial basin. And then we took this result and asked, uh, does that say something about the biology? It's really nice that there's this very pronounced effect between steps, but does it matter at a bigger, uh, from a bigger picture? So if this is your the schematic that you can, you can find countless papers that use this schematic for describing proofreading, it's presented where EFT dissociation and accommodation are two parallel and independent steps. And what we find is that these two steps should not be treated as independent, but rather you should have an accommodation rate with EFTU present or without EFTU present. And that's what our, our simulation is showing us, is that we would expect with EFTU this to be a fast step. Without EFTU, it will be a slow step. So this extends the, the picture for how proofreading uh, may work. So we started looking at what arguments people were making for how the ribosome can distinguish between a correct and an incorrect tRNA. Now at this point, we no longer had calculations uh, making predictions about different tRNA molecules. We just took different ideas that were out there and uh, experimentally supported to some extent. So one picture that was out there is this induced fit mechanism, or this idea that if you have your initial state, your AT state, uh, for the incorrect tRNA, the barrier will be increased, and the free energy of the endpoint will also be increased. Another picture that was out there was what we called the elbow accommodated destabilized uh, sort of picture, where rather than increasing the free energy of the barrier, it only increases the free energy of the endpoint. And you can find these in various papers that they make these arguments that different kinetic signatures are consistent with each of these. Uh, different crystallographic data is consistent with each of them. And again, we didn't want to get in the middle and tell people <laughs> it's going to be induced fit or it's going to be this effect. We rather want it to say, if you look at both of these types of effects, does this role of EFTU have some sort of influence on the overall fidelity of the process? So we took these, these types of schematics. We converted them into relative rates. 
for all of these sub-steps. And then we started calculating things uh, like, whoops, like the proofreading factor. Or what is the, the, the preference for allowing a correct tRNA to be accommodated relative to an incorrect tRNA? And so again, we used our, we just set up a standard steady state kinetic model of this with this description. We put in all of the rates, relative rates into the model. And then we said, as a rate of EF2 dissociation, this is just a normalization factor, what, what is the selectivity for the correct tRNAs? So if EF2 dissociation is very slow, then what happens is you have this wall that prevents anything from being rejected. So it, everything will be accepted eventually. So you get a proofreading factor of one, meaning there's no, no preference for correct versus incorrect tRNAs. As you get EF2 dissociating more rapidly, then this, there's that big barrier that gets introduced, so you can start to reject incorrect tRNAs, and your proofreading factor will go up. However, as that rate of TU dissociation increases further, everything uh, gets rejected. You have this very large barrier for both correct tRNAs and incorrect tRNAs, so this dashed line means it's becoming very inefficient. That is, you're bringing in many tRNAs, everything is getting rejected, only the correct ones pass, but you end up rejecting correct tRNAs as well most of the time, so this is very, uh, not very cost effective because it takes energy to deliver a tRNA each time. So schematically, that's just shown here. We have, if, if EF2 does not dissociate, you always make it to the endpoint. If EF2 dissociates too quickly, everything will be rejected and it will be inefficient. So ideally, there should be some sweet spot in the middle where there's a balance between the rate at which EF2 dissociates and the time scale of this conformational change. And the balance between the two is actually what's important to determining the proofreading factor, getting it to be some, you know, something above one, while also keeping the efficiency relatively high. So this is not a wasteful process. So this is a very nice uh, overall picture, and we put it out there. We're still, you know, it will take a while. It just came out recently, so it'll take a while to see you know, how <laughs> correct it is. Uh, but we presented this to all of the big ribosome groups, including both of the factions and the fights over the rates of accommodation and EFTU kinetics, and nobody has pulled out, uh, pointed out anything saying that we've missed something obvious. <laughs> so if you look at 30 years of biochemical data, this doesn't seem to violate anything that's out there, but it does have a very nice physical basis for how this effect could arise. So hopefully this will stimulate some more interest in the proofreading question, and the, now the biochemists can go and start to test to what extent uh, does this balance of kinetics play a role in fidelity. And then related to that, uh, there's this other piece of the, of the system, because a very elongated uh, region of the RNA, it's about 60 to 100 residues, depending on how you count, and it's right near where the tRNA enters, so it's shown right here. And we wanted to ask, does this also play a role in this overall picture of uh, the rates of, of kinetics. So what we did is we set up models where we could tune the mobility of the L11 stock. So we artificially make it less flexible or more flexible, and then we can recalculate our free energy profiles for accommodation. So this is a region of the ribosome that we're making stiff or loose and asking, does that affect the free energy barrier of this process? And sure enough, we get this rather sizable effect of about maybe 6kT destabilization of an ensemble because again you have this big arm that comes in, it occludes space, it prevents sampling of those configurations that destabilizes this ensemble. Uh, I won't go into detail about this pre-AT state as well, uh, but I can talk about it uh, in private if people are interested in. We then went and asked, well, let's look at both pieces together. So we have this L11 stock that we start changing the mobility, we have EFTU that we know can have this large effect on the accessible states. So if this is your EFTU-free curve with a loose L11 stock, you get some barrier height of a certain scale. Uh, with EFTU present, it destabilizes it partially. And then as you start immobilizing L11, this effect becomes more and more pronounced. So it's not just that EFTU is important, it's not just that L11 is important, but actually the balance of the two can overall uh, tune this barrier to a, to a specific height. And this is very sort of interesting, although I have no evidence of this. Uh, it's interesting because L11 and EFTU are right next to one another, so you can you could imagine that interactions between EFTU can actually affect the stock, which would then 
amplify the effect on the tRNA as well. So there's really this coordinated effect, multiple pieces of this, of this assembly. Everything I'm talking about here are essentially steric effects. We're not trying to account for all of the energetics. We're just trying to, to what extent does shape limit the possibilities. And we think that we're getting a lot of nice, a lot of nice signatures illustrating the balance between these diff different moving, moving components. So now that we have tools available and we've sort of exhaustively applied them to accommodation, that only covered <laughs> one sub-step of this first step of the elongation cycle. So this covers about 20 angstroms of a 250 angstrom process. So we now have the, an approach that we can start chugging through the rest of this cycle and start analyzing and dissecting all the, the steric factors that contribute to each of these sub-steps and start mapping it out. So I'll give you a few examples how we've built on those ideas, looking at the, this uh, hybrid state formation step and this translocation step. And I'll just briefly mention the hybrid state formation results. So hybrid state formation corresponds to when the tRNA molecules bind two adjacent binding sites at the same time. So they, they sort of have to wiggle through this uh, the system. And there are a variety of types of hybrid configurations. I'm just going to talk about one of them. But what we had to consider here was that the tRNAs are now no longer interacting with just one binding site. They're actually interacting with two. So what we did is we defined the uh, two different configurations, both as minima in this, this model. So we define our initial configuration before the tRNAs move as a minimum and afterwards, and now there's competition between these two sites. And when we set this up, this is what the hybrid configuration looks like. It's just displacement of the tRNA of about 20 angstroms. We can, again, calculate hundreds of these transitions. We can start identifying where the transition paths are. We can start analyzing coordinates and use all the same tools that we applied to accommodation to hybrid state formation. And we can find which coordinates are most appropriate for this rearrangement. And when you do that, you can then start pulling out what the transition state structures look like. In this case, here's a snapshot of this transition state, uh, a representative snapshot of the transition state ensemble, where you have very close steric interactions between the another helix, which is called the acyte finger. So the ribosome is just a collection of about 110 helices mashed together. So this is just another big helix that gets in the way. And instead of affecting accommodation, it affects hybrid state formation. It affects the next step. And if we remove this helix, again, the barrier is gone. So we can say that this barrier is a steric barrier arising from this particular helix. And then we took that and said, well, if sterics are so important, the shape of the tRNA molecule must also be important. So if you look at different tRNA species, they actually have different sizes. And in particular, there's a loop called the variable loop that can extend about 15 residues in length. So there's this big uh, steric bulk that is attached to some tRNA molecules. So what we wanted to say was if we look at this transition from AA to AP, this hybrid rearrangement, does this loop uh, cause additional problems? And to what extent does it have an effect on the balance between these conformations and the barrier between them? So we repeated this for tRNA phi and for tRNA lu. We analyze the coordinates, identify good coordinates, and then we do see this big shift in the free energy profile where we've constructed these models to be identical except for this loop. And so there's a nice shift where this loop destabilizes the endpoint by a few kT. A few kT is enough to detect experimentally. You know, it'd be an order, uh, order of magnitude shift in the populations. So we anticipate that the experimentalists will be able to look at this and actually uh, start to detect these types of effects as well. That's all, that's all I'll say about uh, hybrid state formation. And I'll spend the last bit talking about translocation. So hybrid state formation is the beginning of this transition of the, the tRNAs from one site to the next. And then we want to finish that, finish that rearrangement. How do the tRNAs move between binding sites on the small subunit along with the messenger RNA? Location step. Now, as I said up front, the reason we started with accommodation was because it was very simple. There, was, there were no large-scale conformational changes in the ribosome itself. If you look at translocation, that's not the case. If you look at cryo-EM reconstructions, crystallographic uh, models, there are actually very large-scale ro ro rotary motions that have been implicated, being associated with the translocation process. So one of these motions is the entire small subunit undergoes about a 6 to 10 angstrom, a 10 degree rotation 
relative to the large subunit, which is shown in the back. And then, in addition, there's around this vertical axis, there's this called this head domain, which actually has a few proteins. I'm not even showing the proteins here. It's a several hundred RNA residues with about ten, five or ten proteins bound, and that undergoes about a 20 degree rotation in addition. So you look at these cryo-M reconstructions, you get that these domains are all over the place at various stages of the translocation process. And what I'll tell you about today is yet another rotation that people weren't talking about that we found a signature for, uh, which is actually orthogonal to these. So again, if we're looking at translocation, we're looking at how the molecules move from one binding site to the next. So we set up our model where we just define the endpoints as stabilizing. We don't say anything about the intermediates. We set it up, we let them go, and th these would be some arbitrary coordinates describing the motion of the two tRNA molecules. So they are about 30 angstroms from the endpoint initially, and then zero, you know, about one angstrom from the endpoint at the end. So they undergo this spontaneous, roughly 30 angstrom conference change. And for that same trajectory, these would be the rotation coordinates that we see. So one coordinate doesn't do much. The other one goes spontaneously out to about 18 degrees. And this is not encoded in the model. We only put the endpoints, and the, at the endpoints, this angle is zero. So we explicitly define zero as the minimum, and we get 18 transiently during this process. And we know this can only arise from sterics, because that's all we're putting in this model. So we, we calculated a few hundred of these trajectories and evaluated the probability distribution again, where this is one of the minima. The other minimum is actually not even shown. It's way over here. And we just get this whole series of intermediate populations that appear where we only stabilize the endpoints. This is the angle of the head, and this is just a coordinate describing the position of the tRNA molecules. Now, if you look at this peak, which is a very pronounced peak, and it's the most dramatic rotation, uh, we then took several recent cryo-EM reconstructions and calculated, based on those reconstructions, where would they fall in this description? Where is the tRNA molecule, and where is the head? And all three structures fall right within that peak. And we didn't use anything about those structures for the model. Again, it was only the endpoints that were used. So this is actually a very nice um, evidence that we're on the right track, that this sterics description is actually giving us something sensible. And at first, if you can tell, these are rather high-profile papers, PNAS, Science, and Nature. So they were very excited about these intermediates. And what we say is, well, it really, the shape only allows that to happen. They really couldn't get anything else. The, the molecules are so big and so bulky that there's one way it can go through these steps, and that's it. So while it's excellent work they're doing, physically it's a very simple, simple picture, and you wouldn't expect anything other than what was seen. So, so again, it seems like the steric picture is giving us quite a bit. Every time we look at experiments, we seem to understand what's going on. We don't see results that completely contradict anything in the literature that we are aware of. Really putting in a minimal amount of information from an energetic perspective. So in those same, those same trajectories, what we did is we looked at this other rotation of this head, uh, which is a rotation about this line here. And again, as the tRNA moves, we see this transient rotation out to about you know, 10, de 10 degrees, and then you get to the end point. The closest structure out there was this structure where your, the tRNA is in a different position, and there's also a lot of accessory factors. It's not related to normal elongation. There's actually a variety of additional proteins bound. So there's nothing that really lines with this, this, particular, um, this particular intermediate that we're seeing, uh, but we still thought it was interesting and wanted to look at it some more. So we said, well, what is giving rise to that big tilting motion? Can we figure out which factors contribute to it? So my, my student at the time, he said, well, here's, here's, uh, these are some snapshots of this transition. And obviously, the PE loop and S13 are causing this tilting motion. And that's what he wrote in his first draft of the paper. Is interactions between this loop and S13 are causing this motion. And I was like, well, I'm not so sure. Just seeing that they look like they're near each other is strong evidence that it's actually causing anything. You know, try to convince me. You know, I'll, be, I'll be skeptical. And so he came back and said, OK, well, if this is our initial model, where we get this roughly 10 degree tilting, what if we repeat our calculations, but we specifically remove particular steric interactions? So we only remove interactions between the tail of this protein and this tRNA. And this is something you can only do in a computation. 
because there are no indirect effects this way. If you were to actually delete a tail experimentally, there could be all sorts of other indirect effects. Here, we only remove the excluded volume interactions between two molecules. And you get that this effect is attenuated, but not fully. Then he said, well, there's that other region, the PE loop, that he said was interesting. So he removed that instead, and it decreases further. So there's a larger contribution of the loop over this tail. And then he further said, well, what if you remove both of them? This tilting is down in the range of only about four degrees, and that's more or less the range you would expect just from thermal fluctuations about the native basin. So essentially, the majority of this motion can be attributed to steric interactions between this loop and this tRNA, and the tail of this protein and that tRNA. And the, this protein is actually often, um, you know, th that was never suggested that this tail had anything to do with a large-scale conformational change. It, it does come up in the literature as just stabilizing different conformations, and it may do that as well, but it's just a big thing that gets in the way, and somehow the system needs to accommodate this excluded volume. And we say that it's this tilting motion uh, that does so. So this is a representative trajectory. I, I like to show the movies after I show the results, so you don't think we're drawing any conclusions from the movies. Look at them because they're fun and they're you know, illustrative, but we would never write a paper and say, we saw it in the movie, therefore it, it happens. <laughs> Everything we do is based on the statistical analysis of the dynamics. And then we, we make movies to illustrate the points. So again, this is, of course, I'm not showing every atom, but this has 150,000 heavy atoms explicitly represented. And here's that big domain and we'll zoom in and show it in some more detail for what that motion looks like. It doesn't look so dramatic when you look at the full ribosome because this length scale is about 250 angstroms. So these are actually big you know, 10 to 20 angstrom motions that you're seeing. So we start our simulations. This is elongation factor TU, which um, for the most part just sits there. However, you do get this compaction of domain four and the two tRNA molecules, and this is according to a lot of metrics, within one angstrom of known structures. Then you have this PE loop, which we showed is important for this tilting motion. It interacts with the tRNA, and it has to go around the tRNA in order for this head to reset back to its original configuration. So, the, so this isn't a real elaborate story. right? All I've been telling you is that molecules take space, and therefore there are certain things that can happen. right? It's, it's probably the simplest picture you could come up with for something like this system. However, even with just that consideration, we're starting to get all these pieces that seem to explain or correspond to various uh, states that are known experimentally. So we, th we think this is a very uh, a promising avenue to dissecting the at least how the steric effects contribute dynamics in this big assembly. So this is very, I'll, s I'll say one last thing about translocation and then I'll wrap up. And that was on February 3rd last year, our paper came out. <laughs> and then February 28th, a single molecule study uh, came out from the Blanchard group. This is not a group that we were communicating with. The only thing we knew was they were looking at translocation. We hadn't spoken to them in years. And three weeks after our paper comes out saying, head tilting is important to translocation. They have a paper that comes out uh, yeah, 25 days later <laughs> that says, exaggerated head motion is critical for translocation. And so how did they make that claim? Well, they put some single molecule uh, probes, some, some FRET dyes in there, and they saw there was this very large drop in FRET prior to an increase during this reaction, during this process. So there was some sort of extension of this distance right before translocation completes. And so we took our data. We didn't do any new simulations. We just analyzed the, the trajectories that we already had. And we said, well, if this is the distance that they're looking at with their FRET, uh, fret dies. Let's look at the distance and let's order our, or synchronize our times using the same protocols that they did. So we have sort of a one-to-one -one comparison of what they see and what our calculations are showing. And what we see is they see a big drop before an increase. We see an increase before a big drop, which is expected because we're looking at distances, they're looking at fret. And then we said, well, what is the head rotation doing? And it does the same thing. It goes up before it comes back down, and those two uh, peaks are actually well aligned in time. So it would suggest that their first experiment, this L5S13 measurement, is going to be very sensitive to head rotation, uh, this uh, one rota rotary motion of this large domain. Then they had another experiment in the same paper where they looked at 
the distance between the tRNA and this protein S13. And what they reported was there's this little blip where it drops before it comes back up partially. So we, again, we took our trajectories, calculated the corresponding distances, and said, you know, are we seeing something that looks similar? So they see this drop down before a partial increase. We see an increase before a partial drop that looks almost like the inverse of what they're, what they're showing. We then looked at our head tilting coordinate and again synchronized them all the same way. And the peaks for the second coordinate align very well for this tilting motion. So what this suggests is actually that their, their first experiment is reporting on head rotation or sort of a motion along that direction. And the second experiment is reporting rotation about this other rotation direction, this tilting motion. So as far as we can tell, our predicted dynamics are completely consistent with everything they put in their paper, which is astounding when you consider like that never happens, that you, <laughs> you make some sort of loud predictions about what can happen, and then three weeks later, an experimental group shows single molecule data supporting it without you knowing it. Right? We were just completely floored when we, when we saw that. And then I'll close with actually a quote from their, their paper, because in their closing statements, they say, however distinct movements, including the tilting of the head domain, they go on, cannot be ruled out. So they don't interpret their data in terms of tilting, but they say that they can't say tilting is not occurring. And then the very last sentence of their paper <laughs> reads, uh, they have all these insights that are important, therefore you need, a combination, you need this in combination with quantitative molecular dynamic simulations. And so my answer is yes, we agree, and we already did it, uh, and it just happened to come out at essentially the exact same time. So we completely agree with how they finished their paper, and we, we love that. This will probably never happen again in my career that an experimentalist will say we need to verify these points a few weeks after we essentially verify those points. So in summary, with these simplified models, we can identify appropriate reaction coordinates, which can give ideas for how to design more effective single molecule studies. It also allows us to precisely relate our uh, predictive free energy barriers to experimental kinetics. We can start to dissect how the steric contributions of different factors dictates what can happen in these large assemblies. And we can also look at perturbations, right? We, we've done a lot of work where we remove a helix, we add a helix, we change the flexibility, we introduce a molecule, remove a molecule, and look at the relative effects of these different pieces. So it's essentially trying to assemble this very complicated engine one piece at a time. So with that, I'll thank everybody that I've been working with. Um, Jeff Noel's done uh, almost all of the accommodation work except for the really early stuff that I was talking about. Joyce did the L11 work. Uh, George and Vitor, we've done all the reaction coordinate analysis uh, together. Uh, I didn't get to talk about Mariana's work, unfortunately. Ken did the translocation work. I, I didn't show any explicit solvent simulations, but all the explicit solvent simulations were in collaboration with Carissa Sambamatsu. And uh, we'll have a workshop today on structure-based models. Uh, and so here's our, sort of our team that's been developing that software. Uh, and as you know, you can use that software for free. Uh, and I'll thank the NSF for, for funding and obviously all of the computing resources as well because these are not, not cheap calculations. And with that, I'll thank you for your, for your time.